So this is about the Sham Shoreline Attribution Machine, uh, which is a tool in PyDRO that lets you do all the attribution and processing of feature data uh, for review in CARES and for submission with, with your projects to satisfy the limited shoreline verification thing that we do in the field. Uh, we had a big problem in the past. We probably still have a problem where we have a lot of different methods for doing this in terms of data acquisition and a lot of different ways to process, uh, especially related to feature attribution. So this is sort of an effort to standardize and to try to make sense of a lot of the uh, calculations that are involved, water levels and such. OK, so Sham is in the raw data access conversion side of Pydro. And on the right here, you get all the documentation that goes into Sham. This sort of talks about what, it, what it'll do, uh, what features it'll touch, uh, what acronyms, what feature types it works with, uh, and then some of the calculations and how those work. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through the three modes in Sham. I'm going to talk about uh, the data processing side and how to understand what Sham is doing and how to review it after, after it runs. So cut it open right here. And first, I'm going to talk about the traditional mode, because I think this, this aligns closely with what people think of when it comes to shoreline. So this is where you go out on a skiff, uh, a boat that doesn't actually have, necessarily have a POSMV system. It's just you, maybe with a GPS backpack and a laser rangefinder, or some other method for getting a position of a rock. Uh, and then you you entering that into an S57 in Keras or something like that. And you take it back and then you process it to get, you know, tidally corrected numbers for figuring out the attribution stuff. That's sort of the traditional approach. So one thing that's been missing for the most part is this approach with Takari. So if you do tides in Sham, it'll take in a ZDF, a zone file, or a Takari file for doing uh, water level attribution for tidally correcting, tidally correcting stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demo with some data I have here. See, I have a S57, right? As it says, it's got you know an observed depth and an observed time, which are the two NOAA attributes that we use for this uh, uh, field acquisition of this of uh, shoreline features. So I'm going to take this, bring it in here, like so. Right, Takari, uh, I don't have pictures associated with this. I'll show you the picture thing later, but for now, I'm just going to leave this is blank. Uh, I'm not going to put in a wireline offset, which I'll, again, I'll explain later. And then this is a sort of metadata that goes into like the uh, um, source indication, the, the store end. Uh, I think that might be the only place where sheet shows up. Anyway, this is just metadata that goes into the feature attribution. Right? If you want to sort at, you have to tell me what date to put in because it might not be today. It might be you know, a week from now when you're finished, finished with a project. And then you get start. So a bunch of things start happening. It'll uh, take your Takari file. It'll download water levels for your area and your time. And it will generate processed S57 data. So what I've done is I've taken this output, you see like this block, for instance, this corresponds to one feature. Uh, and this tells you everything you need to know to, to double check or to understand how Sham is making these numbers 
come about. So what I've done here is I've taken a diagram, which I'll share with you guys later. And let's see if I can get this right. Take a diagram. Shrink this thing. Come on. All right. I shrink this thing so you can see it, right? And then let me make sure, yeah, it's this one. Okay, so here's you, right, on your boat with your rangefinder, your little backpack. Again, this isn't, this isn't how you have to do this. This is just, you know, one way that I'm familiar with for this traditional method. Uh, and then you're getting this rock, and you get a water line. Sorry, a, um, a local local mean sea level, local like instantaneous water line value height of uh, 0.3 meters, 0.3 meters up. And you see that over here, that's that's what Sham is reporting as well. This is just that OBS DPT value, your observed depth. Uh, we put in a zero for water line, and that's that's sort of all you can understand in the field. Right, I'm looking at this rock, it's 30 centimeters from the water line. So then what Sham does is it queries the Takari grid and it gives you these separation values. Uh, and you need to have both. So it gives you mean high water and mean low low water. Uh, you need both because that tells you your water level, which which category you're in for what lev. So in this instance, we have mean low low water, uh, a mean low low water reference depth of 55 centimeters. Yep, right up here. Yeah, 55 centimeters. And then we have a mean high water height of 64 centimeters, roughly. The confusion here a lot of times comes with the, um, the sign right? Is it positive up or positive down? So everywhere that, that comes up, uh, I've tried to say, you know, positive up, positive down, just to make sense of it. So uh, suffice to say, this height reference to mean low, low water and mean high water is somewhere in between it. So it's not always dry. It's not submerged. It's a uh, this covers, uncovers water level. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the uh, spec necessarily for what this actually corresponds to in terms of ranges. Uh, I do show it here so you can look at these numbers and say, okay, that makes sense. Uh, but th this is the calculation that it does to figure that out, figure this watt lift thing out. And then it'll tell you, right, uh, you know, it's a shoreline construction, so we're going to make all this attribution that we know should go in for shoreline construction, uh, all of this stuff, and it's going to do that for every feature that's in there. As long as you have, right, this target depth, right, I can't, I can't figure that out for you. So you have to make sure target depth and observe time, observe depth, observe time are in the file. All right. And then, right, if I take Keras, here, here's your files. We just started with these, it's just three new ones. There's the log that has everything that we've looked at, all this stuff, everything that comes out of the Apple window. And then we have uh, this new Takari. This might not show up for you, depending on whether or not you have water levels in there already. And if it didn't have to download it, it won't create a new one. Uh, and then this new S57, which is what you are mostly interested in. So if I pull this up, there's just four things in here, right? Four things. And I look at feature 4201, this one right here. Zoom to uh, super selection. Yeah, I've never been able to figure that out. Uh, okay, zoom to super selection, right? 
So if I look at the shoreline construction here, right, it's got all the stuff that uh, we talked about earlier with the um, observed depth, observed time that you gave me, and then the water level, right, the adjustment, the height, right, all this stuff that uh, Sham came up with. Just pushes it right in the file. You don't have to go into Keras and type stuff in. With the exception of some of this stuff, like I don't know if it's a seawall and if it's ruined or not, right? There's some stuff that you can't really tell from just data, the qualitative stuff. So if you, if you need to do that, you're going to have to do that anyway. Okay. I've had some issues with Keras with, well, I could try closing stuff. Sometimes it crashes. Okay, so that's the traditional mode. Um, just to clear this up, I'm just going to close and reopen this just to give you a fresh view of how this works. So now we're going to talk about the Velodyne approach, which is sort of the it's like the modern, modern West Coast feature acquisition method. All right. So I'm going to take this, and then I'm going to pull up my next test data set, which is this guy. All right, so this is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a lot more, or a couple more files than the previous method. So first, uh, it's going to want the same uh, S57 to start with that it's going to populate. This is something that we're currently generating through HiPack. And then this is a HiPack export of the data that's in the high pack data set. Okay. And then which we're going to switch to um, ERS. Right. And then we're going to take this S bed that goes with the launch. Let's, we're going to leave images blank because we don't have pictures for this one. And then we're going to run this with PMVD, which means you have to specify the grid. So I'll explain this stuff in a second. Let me just set it up. Set it up first. All right. Uh, I believe with this one, we are going to have to put in a waterline offset. And then we'll leave this blank just because this is just test metadata. Okay, so the Veldine workflow, what we're going to do is we're going to take the S57 that you generate from HiPack, the export with the height and the position that you generate from HiPack again, uh, the process SBET that you need for ellipsoid height, and then the PMVD that we need for the separation values. Uh, in the same way that we needed Takari for the separation values in the title mode, you need... Uh, you need these grids. If you're within VDAM coverage, I can just query it for you. But since this specific survey uh, is in like Lesiansky uh, Inlet in Alaska, uh, we needed PMVD to uh, cover that area. So one note here, uh, this all this red text, pay special attention to this. So for PMVD to work, as it goes away with VDAM, for PMVD to work, I need to have a base editor to cut out the specific areas that are important uh, for each feature, which I'll show you. Okay. So when I run this, it's going to take a little bit longer. What's going to happen is it's going to um, take your feature positions and then it's going to cut out the relevant areas in the PMBD grid so I can get those mean low water, mean high water separation values. Uh, and then it's going to run the same calculations uh, 
as we did with the tidal approach with the exception of needing an ellipsoid height so things are referenced to the ellipsoid. So it's a little bit more complicated. But again, I've got a diagram here where I try to make sense of this. So let me get, I think it was the last one. Uh, 2.462. No, maybe it was the first one. They were a bunch in here. 2.462. Yeah. And then it was this one. All right. So the calculations, again, should look pretty similar. Uh, in that we're just getting right depth this time, reference to the ellipsoid, separation values to get us to mean low, low water, mean high water, and then an assessment to see where the height lies with regards to these datums. So um, what I have here is the target depth that we get from high pack. Uh, in this case, it was reference to the water line because that's what HIPEC um, asks you to do. Uh, so I put in a water line offset that represents, you know, what you might have for your boat. Uh, and then I had an SBIT height. So all these arrows, or these two at least, are coming from the transducer because that's what we have as the reference point in a lot of our boats. All of the launches, I think. Um, this specific place is a little bit weird. I had to double check just because I was uncertain myself, but right here's our area. And Lysiansky Inlet. Uh, so if you're used to doing most work on the East Coast, you may be surprised to find that uh, the ellipsoid would be underneath you. But in this specific instance, uh, I believe that is the case, about three meters or so underneath this boat. Or nearly it might be up here somewhere, right? So uh, looking at this, you have depth plus waterline plus height gets you the height of the rock to the ellipsoid. And then you have the PMVD to give you from ellipsoid to these datums. And then you get these depths and heights relative to these datums. And that's what these numbers are here. All right, so I've got you know, 0.58 for target depth, waterline, separation values, final depth, final depth. 0 0.215 minus 3.178. And that's reference to this red line here. So since the rock is uh, below mean low low water uh, by you know more than 10 centimeters which is the current spec then it gets the watt left as of always underwater so um, the significant advantages of using sham in this particular instance are one there's not a whole lot of tools that are incorporating you know PMVD Caesar grids to get shifts of S57 data. In fact, I don't think that exists anywhere else. Basically just here. Uh, and two, trying to do this whole calculation uh, in your head or just by looking at these numbers it can be daunting. So having this part of it automated is, is a bit of a help. Uh, because I get super confused about this stuff myself when I'm not just running it through a tool like this. Okay, anyway, so if I go back to Keras and I look at, yeah, right here. This guy, pull him in. Here's all my features. Uh, let's see, which one are we looking at? 14. 14. 
14. Super selection. Okay, this guy. So if I look at this rock, uh, here's all the numbers that we came up with. It's only displaying to the nearest uh, tenth of a meter. But uh, the S57 has all the, the data just like just like shown here. Yep, looks like it's all in there. Submerged. Okay. So that's the Velodyne approach. Uh, I will say that if you're curious about visualizing these numbers that I came up with, I do leave a few things here that you can use. Right, so what I'm looking at now is this raw depth that I leave here. And this is just the height, or not, not the height, you have to be really careful about your language here, but this is the right, the um, high pack exported depth for each of those features that I use to cut out the set values from the model. So this guy, uh, let's see, let me actually highlight the right thing. Um, I don't think this was the feature we were looking at, but you can see there's a, there's a 20 a minus 0.2 meter depth associated with this S57, and then there's these SEP model numbers, right? So these three numbers are what I'm using basically in uh, in Sham to give you the correct uh, height or Valsau, what lev, the whole thing. Okay. Let me, can I do close all? No. Okay. Okay. Close source. Do not save. All right. Um, so then I've got this third mode here, which is where I talk about the one of the last things that I haven't really discussed which is this images thing. So if I look at um, some data that I've got here, and I pull up images, okay, same metadata. Okay, so this would be an example of um, you conducting a normal survey, you have a mean low, low water, low, low water grid, and you're just trying to take uh, things that show up in your multi beam that you need to make an S57 from and do all of the attribution, um, renaming pictures and, and all, all the stuff that goes into that whole exercise. Uh, so I found that people were talking about doing this on the TJ, on the Jefferson, and then amongst the NRTs. So I figured, uh, you know, it's just sort of a, a little bit of, sorry, this is a little bit of how all this thing works. So I'll just do like a little offshoot for the multi-beam derived feature thing. So if I look at this guy and I keep this down here. And I hit start. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. What it's going to do is take uh, features that I currently had, you know, with a depth, because I'm looking at like the, uh, the mean level water grid. I'm not doing any of the SEP model stuff. You're just, you're giving me mean level water. So I'm just, I'm running with that. And I do all the little attribution. So all the stuff that I was doing for all the other modes, remarks, recommendations, uh, 
some of the other little, the sword at sword and stuff. Uh, and then the water level, which I'll take care of, uh, with the exception of, I think I talked about it here. Right here you are, you've got a multi-beam thing, you've got a feature, you want to put an, an S57, make an S57 out of it. Uh, I'll do the watt left thing as long as it just covers these modes. Because I won't have a mean high water reference, so I can't tell you if it's always dry, because that relies on knowing your mean high water thing. So the assumption here is that you're not trying to do this multi-beam derived mode with things that are out of the water, which I think is a good assumption. I think that works. Uh, I guess we'll find out. But that's why you'll get, uh, if I get the right feature, you know, things with water level, it, it will have a water level assigned to it as long as it's something that I can actually sign. Okay, and then, right, if I pull in the old one, and I zoom in on feature, you'll see, right, there's a bunch of stuff that's blank. There's an image here. Uh, it's not with the right name. If I look at the new one, it's got the right name and the new one. And there's a sham data images folder, right? So the old one has, you know, names that you came up with, and the new one's got the uh, appropriate names. Bottom stables have a different convention, so it covers that too. So I think this sort of covers that little niche case of. Uh, Of, uh, features relative to mean level grids. Okay, so those are the three modes. Um, over here in the right, basically anything in red, I really want you to pay attention to. So, right, there are there are requirements here for these modes that I sort of talked about already. The observed depth, observed time, which is a requirement for traditional mode. The uh, Velodyne mode requires these exports. Uh, the multi derived mode, you have to give me a description. And then if you want me to do uh, image renaming, you have to put in like the old image name into the S57, just so I know which picture goes with which feature. Um, so just pay attention to what I'm saying over here. Um, I think that's mostly it. I will say so. This is this tool might evolve a little bit in the future. Uh, I'm trying to attach it to some of the new stuff that might be coming down the pipe with um, drone acquisition, with uh, possibly a handheld device that might replace the old GPS backpack laser rangefinder method. Um, so some of this might evolve a little bit, but uh, I think the core of it is basically what it is. So I'll make sure to keep everybody in the loop. Let's see. Yep, and I think that's it. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, and you can always let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I think everybody knows who I am at this point, but if you need to get in touch with me, you can just use this email address here, and I will get back to you. All right, thanks.